everything here should be underwater. We need water now. We need water for shorebirds, songbirds, waterfowl, bald eagles, all wildlife. It needs water on this refuge now. We have a solution. We buy it. We buy it from willing sellers, ranchers and farmers that are willing to sell us water to fill this refuge. With this plan, we can restore Klamath to its former greatness forever. The biggest problem we face in the Klamath Basin right now is water. When I saw how dry and barren it was, devoid of all wildlife, it was just shockingly sorrowful. In 2020, we had one of the worst water years in history in the Klamath Basin. The refuge complex that we love so much, that's so important for the birds, received very little water. There's been times when there's been less water, more water, but never as dry and as empty and as barren as it is today. This is the uh, second lowest allocation in the history of the Klamath Project, just surpassed only by the 2001 water shutoff where the allocation was zero. You'll see suffering birds, you'll see sick and dying birds. It's gone from the most prolific wildlife spot in the entire Pacific Flyway to the worst. This year that happened. That doomsday scenario that we always talked about happened. The Klamath National Wildlife Refuge Complex is the crown jewel of the Pacific Flyway. It's the first refuge ever designated for the purpose of waterfowl conservation. Historically, over 80% of the flyway would touch down here and use the Klamath Basin. Birds coming and going will stop there throughout the entire year and depend on that refuge for their survival. It's just so biologically productive. It's like no other. It is the keystone of the Pacific Flyway. It is wide and vast and grand, and yet it's serene. It's the kind of landscape that defines us. I'll tell you, it's the most important spot in all of the Pacific Flyway. If you can image an hourglass in that narrow spot right in the middle, that's the Klamath. It's the key to everything above it and below it. More than 350 species of birds rely on the Klamath complex of refuges. We have up to a million birds a year that are moving through here. Hundreds of thousands of colonial water birds, pelicans, ibis, cormorants. This is actually one of the highest concentrations of bald eagles in the entire lower 48 states. The migrations that these birds do is just incredible. It's historically ingrained into the waterfowl population's movements and migrations. So when the birds are coming through, they're really relying on this landscape to stop here, to rest, and to refuel. And so what we'll see is the birds that first stop here in Klamath, then pick up and travel down to the Sacramento Valley. Many of them will stay and overwinter in the Sacramento Valley. Some of them will continue a journey much further south. And then when it's time to return, the birds come back up through the Klamath Refuge Complex as well. Thousands of years doing the same routes. Um, I really like the thought of that. This whole thing from mountain to mountain was one big wetland. It entailed some 360,000 acres of wetland. Today, it's reduced to about 90,000, a significant difference. If you go into the surrounding landscape, we've lost 80% of the wetlands up here. Well, we're here at a moment in time. What you see here is a marsh that's going dry the first time in over 75 years. Without water, Klamath becomes a magnet for disease. The refuge was created to preserve wildlife, but instead, it could become a death trap. This year in the basin turned out to be a really bad year for botulism. Almost every wetland we have on the refuge complex this year is dealing with some level of a botulism outbreak. It's a bacteria that lives in the soil. It's in all wetland soils, all over the west, pretty much. Anytime we get over 90 degrees during the day and 50 degrees at night and you get a receding wetland where there's a lot of decaying vegetation or there's a lot of invertebrates on the shoreline to create a protein for that bacteria to start its life cycle. Once units start drawing down and mud flats become exposed, then that bacteria starts creating the neurotoxin. 
When there's a botulism outbreak and birds are going through the molting process, they can't pick up and fly to the next location. So they're actually stuck in this area with unhealthy water and disease outbreak. Due to the lack of water, we had over 60,000 birds die from botulism this year. I mean, without water to manage these die-offs, you're just in a position where you have a drying wetland that the environmental conditions are good for the botulism to start its life cycle and take off. The biggest die-off we've dealt with in the last 25 to 30 years. Take multiple airboats out. We have airboats running every day with a crew that goes out with cages to pick up sick, affected birds. Birds with botulism, basically what it does is it causes muscle paralysis. They're just pretty lethargic. The airboats are incredibly loud. So if a bird is not alarmed by that or us approaching it, then that's definitely a big signal that something's wrong. The real bad spots are kind of closer to the marsh area where there's more uh, exposed soils. And then we have grabbers that we pull the dead birds out of the environment and get them into bags and get them to an incinerator to get them out of the environment. To manage botulism is controlling the maggot cycle. So getting as many birds out of the contaminated environment as possible is the best way to start changing the trend of the outbreak. And while that happens naturally every year, the degree to which it happens, there is some control that managers have over if they have the right amount of water at the time that they need it, because timing is also really important. We pick up the dying live birds and we put them in a crate and we bring them back to the Lower Klamath Duck Hospital and there, there are rehabilitation partners that help run the hospital and bring the birds back to health. So I'm volunteering with the Klamath Basin National Wildlife Refuges, banding ducks that have been rehabbed from botulism. In the last week, we've recovered and banded close to a thousand ducks. From what I've observed, they'll take a duck that's paralyzed and they let it rest for a few hours in the traps that they've caught them in. Then they give them a vitamin D, vitamin A, dextrose and sucrose, and then they let them rest and they prop them up with what they call a donut under their chin. They're so paralyzed they can't hardly breathe. And they're just basically put on clean water so that they can flush their systems. Each day the duck gets better, gets moved to the next stage of rehab until eventually it's in a pond where it's swimming around and eating mealworms and duckweed and so then I get to band them and then let them go. For this project this year, I always thought once ducks got botulism it was a death sentence and there was nowhere to go. The fact that they've had this hospital in place now for three years and they're rehabbing all these ducks and they're fine when we let them go and they can continue on and reproduce and <laughs> get re-caught in our traps. We've gotten five from previous years that they rehabbed so far. I came here when I was 13 years old. Everything I saw behind me was water and thousands of birds enjoying this habitat. People from all over North America come to this very spot to watch that. Now it's gone. Whenever you talk about water in the Klamath Basin, it's a tricky subject. Everybody that's in the basin and works in the basin, and lives in the basin, faces the issue of water constantly. The farmers, ranchers, uh, irrigators, and, and, and the refuges, it means everything, and it is everything. Water is the lifeblood of this basin. One of the challenges that we have with the Klamath National Wildlife Refuge Complex is our water rights are junior. In difficult years in particular, it's very hard for the refuge to get the water that it needs. We watch the water almost every day. We watch the lake fill up, we watch the snowpack, we watch the inflows, we watch the outflows. Everybody's watching everybody's consumption. It's highly monitored and everybody knows what's going on. Water is a scarce resource and we know that it's becoming harder and harder to take this limited resource and meet all the demands we make of it. Wetland management is all about timing of water. Timing of water on, timing of water off. There's just no way 
that refuge managers that control Lower Klamath can plan and optimize habitat conditions when they don't even know year to year if they're going to receive any water at all. We don't know if we're going to get water. We don't know when we're going to get that water. We don't know how much water we're going to get and we don't know how long that water will be delivered for. If we had reliable water deliveries, we could start making prescriptive management actions that would allow us to manage the habitat for the diversity of water birds across all life cycles. It feels like everyone's back is to the wall. Because of that, everyone's defending their own needs. Klamath Basin has a long history of hostile debates over water rights. For 25, 30 years that I've been involved with this, uh, it's been always fighting for an allocation of a precious and dwindling resource. This is the Wood River Valley. What you're looking at are tributaries and rivers that originate at the bottom of Crater Lake and they run through this valley. These rivers will flow directly into Agency Lake and Klamath Lake and ultimately through that lake into the river system and the refuge. The solution is buying water rights, and, and water rights are different than leasing water. It's perennial, it's forever. This will provide a full year-round supply of water for that refuge. It's willing buyers and willing sellers benefiting the resource. On any large-scale conservation effort, you have to work with all stakeholders. It's important to get all the water users together to work out the balance of uses so that everyone can be accommodated. I have been involved in projects where it seemed there was no solution that was gonna work. And I firmly believe that we can arrive at a solution for the Klamath. The issues that we're facing in Klamath Basin have a direct impact on areas throughout the Pacific Flyway. Whether it's Sacramento, San Francisco, Tulare, Merced, Sacramento Valley, you're gonna see a lot less birds. We're already starting to see the effects of what could happen if we don't find a solution for the Klamath Basin. And so it's time to have that conversation and figure out a way to make sure it does get the water it needs. We know how to manage these wetlands. What we need is a guaranteed amount of water. We can make the habitat better not just here on the refuge, but throughout the, the entire Klamath Basin. Anybody who has a commitment and a respect for nature and wildlife will look at that refuge and understand the role it plays and be committed to ensure its health and welfare going forward. Leave the world better than you found it. And this is one of those moments where we actually have the chance to make that so. If we want a thriving Pacific Flyway, add water to the refuge, and the rest will take care of itself. It's up to us to make sure there's water on this landscape. And this place can bounce back. We've seen it before. When water gets on this landscape, the wetlands respond and the birds respond to the wetlands. We are supported by sportsmen, bird watchers, farmers, ranchers, tribes, and legislators. Many paths, we share one truth, water for fish and wildlife. The Klamath is dying for a drink. We can buy that drink. With your help, we can restore Klamath to its glory. <laughs>